I was working most of the night on a two-bit case that turned into something bigger, so I headed straight for the office that next morning. See, I was, uh... Well, I'd been trying to find out where this big-shot bootlegger was keeping this underage runaway girl I was looking for, so I sponsored a little shootout that night at a rum runner's warehouse to get the phone number and address. The bootlegger got himself a slug in the arm, but I got the girl and her father hauled her home. And now... Well, how was I to know that the big shot bootlegger who played house with underage girls was also a member of the vice commission? And for 12.50 a day, I'm not expected to know everything. City Hall had managed to make the vice commissioner into a knight in shining armor, and my name was Mud again. And for a week, I'm looking for a guy with a mole on his neck. And then I find out the one thing he didn't tell me was the guy only had one arm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, morning, Ham. Morning, Ham. All the virgins of the world are safe again. Not while you're alive. Oh. Look what I brought you. A little present from the festivities we had last night. How's the old man? Oh, he'd love to see you. Well, you'll have that pleasure in a moment. <clears throat> oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, the man responsible for last night has already been dismissed. Well, thank you, sir. Horse feathers. Oh, turn that damn thing off, will you? Oh, pretty rich here. Oh, is that a radio in our own office? That's, that's very ritzy. Yeah, the wife thought it might calm my ulcers. <laughs> I swear, one of these days there'll be a radio in every house and we'll be a nation of nervous wrecks. Who's that on the phone? Get the whitewash buckets out already? Yeah, you did it to me again, Ham. You didn't tell me that that bootlegger with the underage girlfriend was a member of the vice commission. Well, ah, what the hell. I suppose if you caught the mayor in a cat house, they'd say he was there on a medical inspection. You know the routine. Of course. <laughs> well, I told him I sent you up to Cleveland. Oh, I don't want anybody painting a target on your back. Oh, well, that's considerate of you. Yeah, well, you know, this ain't a rest home. Uh, Edgar Leggett, an insurance case. Seems that uh, a couple of hundred bucks worth of unset diamonds were burgled from his house. Have cops been there and gone? Oh, yeah. The insurance company would like to get the diamonds back, but they know we know that that's practically impossible, so they just want to go through the motions for a day. Now, uh, I don't think that calls for any bodies laying around to you. What, is that a reprimand? No. <laughs> hell no, Ham, hell no. No, that girl's pappy was in here this morning with a smile and a big check. You, uh, you get results and we get paid. That's what the home office and we're in business for. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Now, oh, uh, by the way, there weren't any innocent people killed last night, were there? There are no innocent people. The Leggett House was a short drive from the city. I should have known when I saw the house there was something fishy about this whole thing right from the start. I gamble a little, and I know something about odds. One thing for sure, finding eight stolen unset diamonds in this city didn't even come under the heading of remote possibilities. Which means finding this one right here like that. Hmm. Can I help you? 
Uh, I'm uh, Hamilton Nash. I'm a detective. I uh, would like to talk with you and your husband, if I may. I don't understand. The detectives have already been here. The public detectives. I'm a private detective. Dickerson National. We represent the insurance companies. Oh, I see. Gabrielle, don't stay under the lamp too long. You'll get burnt. This way, please. Oh, yes. I do hate to keep disturbing my husband at his work. Well, we can't allow the burglars to get the idea they can just go running around the house at night stealing things because we're too busy to do anything about it, though, can we? I don't know what's happened to the world, do you, Mr. Uh... Nay. No, ma'am, I haven't the slightest idea. Hmm. Oh, well, of course, Halsett and Beauchamp would have taken out insurance on the diamonds. I, I just didn't give it a thought. Well, insurance companies consider burglaries contrary to nature. Oh, oh, oh what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. I beg your pardon? Well, it's not as though Edgar asked for the diamonds, you know. The jewelers practically forced them on him. Oh. <laughs> yes, they'd heard about his patent for coloring glass, and they thought that he might be able to treat diamonds to make them worth more. Now, that is being dishonest, wouldn't you say, Mr. Nash? Uh, Mrs. Leggett. Oh, it's all right, Minnie. It's just another detective to ask about the diamonds. But I never stole nothing in my whole life. Except maybe when I was a child and didn't know no better. And don't you be looking at me. Did the police accuse you of stealing the diamonds, Minnie? Uh, Mr. Nash, I'll... Oh, no. No, not right out. But they skinned me with their eyes. <laughs> you police are all alike. Oh, I'm not a policeman, Minnie. I'm a private eye. Oh, no, please. Don't turn no evil eye on me. Mr. Nash. Mr. Nash, will you please come and sit in the study, and I'll fetch my husband. I had a feeling I was being stared at. Just a painting. Some lady long dead. But the face is familiar. Hmm. Oh well. I could tell something about Leggett before I even met him. He had expensive tastes. The rug was oriental. furniture hadn't been ground out by machinery and the erotic porcelains hadn't been selected by a prude. Pale Egyptian. Hmm. Owen Fitzstephan had promised to give me a copy of this when I knew him a few years back. Of course, I never held him to it. He was quite drunk at the time. So, I see he sold one copy, at least. Unless he gave it away. How do you do? I'm Edgar Leggett. How do you do? I'm Hamilton Nash. I'm sorry to disturb you. Oh, that's quite all right. I had come to uh, an impasse in a formula. Mm -hmm. How many people knew you were experimenting with oh, this? I have no idea. It was no particular secret. Uh -huh. You didn't discover the theft until this morning? No. No, I was coming downstairs and I noticed that the front door was ajar. And when I went into the kitchen, I found that the back door had been pried open. And nothing else was taken? Not that we are aware of. You didn't hear anything last night? No. Uh, I did tell the policeman that I had noticed a man from my bedroom window. 
He was going past our driveway, and I, I caught a glimpse of him under the light, but he was going away from the house, and the police didn't seem to think it was of any importance. Anyone you knew? No, but my daughter, our daughter, did say that she had noticed a man looking up at the house a few nights ago. My dear Alice, I don't think we should put too much stock in anything Gabrielle says. Oh, I'd like to talk with her. You mind? I'll get her for you. Yes. And I'd like to see that cabinet that was pried into as well, may I? <laughs> Why, yes, of course. Will you follow me? Yes. I don't understand the economics of the insurance company, Mr. Nash. The eight diamonds were small, imperfect, worth maybe five, six hundred dollars at most. Imagine paying to find almost untraceable stones. Well, with insurance companies, it's a matter of principle. Ah. This is the cabinet, Mr. Nash. The mechanism was jammed when he forced open the drawer. How much success have you had with the diamonds? I beg your pardon? I'm coloring them perfect, how much uh, success have you had? Oh. Oh, no, none whatever. I explained the uh, implausibility of it to Mr. Holstead and Mr. Beauchamp from the start. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's too bad. Mrs. Leggett seems to think it's a bit dishonest. I wasn't aware of that. Well, here we are. Gabrielle, this gentleman would like to ask you about the uh, man that you and Eric saw outside the other night. Then let the gentleman ask me. You are a gentleman, aren't you? It's all right, dear. Yes, uh, your mother saw a man last night down by the entrance to the driveway under the light. And she thinks maybe you saw the same man on another night. Yes. What other night? It was Sunday morning, early Sunday morning. 3 a.m., Eric was just bringing me home. He's a very nice boy. What did this man look like? Average, suit, coat, hat. Could have been you. Gabrielle sometimes mistakes sarcasm for playfulness, Mr. Nash. I wish you wouldn't talk about me as if I weren't in the room. I sometimes wonder if you are, Gabrielle. <laughs> if you'll excuse me. Ah, uh, yes. I have a headache. She's not been herself lately. Ah, yes. Now, uh, were the diamonds wrapped in anything? They were in individual envelopes. There were eight of them. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't help you any further, Mr. Nash. Mrs. Leggett, I left the apron in the dirty clothes so you won't think that I stole it. And you can send the four dollars I got coming if you see fit. Minnie, what's no. gotten into you? No. Don't try no molly cuddle on me. I don't have to work nowhere anybody thinks that I stole something. I'm as honest as anybody in the world. Minnie! No! Goodbye. Well, I hope you're satisfied now, Mr. Nash. Not quite. I found this on the stoop near the entrance to your house. Does it uh, look familiar? My word, yes. There's a small blurred spot down near the culette. It's obviously one of them. Or maybe we can find the others. I'll help you. Oh, no, I don't think we'll find any more planted diamonds around. I don't understand. The thing I don't understand is the economics of your burglar, Mr. Leggett. He forces his way through the kitchen 
walks right past a room filled with armloads of priceless articles, sneaks up a carpeted stairs, then risks climbing these creaky stairs to the laboratory, walks directly to the cabinet, pries open the exact drawer, and steals a few hundred dollars worth of imperfect diamonds. What are you implying, Mr. Nash? I don't know, Mrs. Leggett, but I'd certainly like to have a talk with that man you saw under the light, wouldn't you? I think I can let myself out. It's, uh, uh, yeah. If you do, I'll kill you. Fair enough. Look at me! What do you see? Uh, see it? The eyes? The ears? See it? I'm an animal. It's a curse. I carry a curse. This whole thing was getting crazy. I started on the case by finding a diamond that shouldn't have been there. And I met a beautiful girl with dancing green eyes who stuck a knife in my throat. And now the man who lost the diamonds was staring out the window at me as if I took them. And any other guy would have probably lied to the insurance company and quit. a good year for bankers. Little ticker tape machines making millionaires by the carload. The old man kept telling me to invest, but I was too suspicious of easy money. I bothered everyone in the Leggett neighborhood, but didn't come up with much. Except there seemed to be two strangers eyeing the Leggett house, one who looked like me and the other one, who everyone agreed, had a big long nose. I decided to pay a visit to Eric Collinson to see if he was that nice boy Mrs. Leggett said he was. Mr. Collinson? Yes, uh, I'm Hamilton Nash. Yes, sir. May I help you? I'm with the Dickerson National Detective Agency. Mrs. Leggett said I could find you here. Is there something wrong with Gabrielle? No, no. There was a burglary out of the house. Good heavens. And Mrs. Leggett said she saw a man leave last night and thought perhaps it was the same man that you and Miss Leggett saw another night. Uh, when was it? Saturday night, I believe? Oh, well, yes, there was this man. But... Do you have any identification? Uh, 
I understand that the man was about my size, my build. Uh, did you see his face? Uh, no, he, it was too dark. Hmm. Too dark? What time was it? Uh, about midnight, or a little after, perhaps. That's strange. Miss Leggett said that it was around 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, I do just talk that up to chivalry, I guess. Well, actually, Miss uh, Leggett is a little nearsighted. And what she took for 3 o'clock was most probably quarter after 12. Were there any distinguishing marks on him? Was he wearing glasses, a mustache, sideburns, a limp, an Al Smith button, anything? No. I just thought he might be a late night guest of the Leggetts. Except for what Gabrielle said. Except for what Gabrielle said? What did she say? Look, I'd rather not. Uh, I mean, uh, Gabrielle wasn't feeling herself that night, and, uh... What'd she say? She said, look, that man has a dead face. Dead face? What the hell does a dead face mean? Gabrielle has luminous ways of putting things sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't get it. Listen, I have a lot of work to do now, and if you don't mind, I'd like to get on to it. What I mean is that uh, you look like a healthy specimen. Good teeth, sound wind, strong limbs. I just don't put you with a strange cookie like Gabrielle Leggett. Gabrielle and I are engaged. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't see a ring. Well, that's just because I haven't been able to uh... I'll find the right diamond. I'm sure you're mistaken, Mr. Nash. I'm not saying that he was a thief. I just, I just think that his robbery smells a little sour. Well, I refuse to believe that. When Mr. Leggett phoned to say that the diamonds had been stolen. I reported it to the insurance company as a matter of routine. Yes, well, you see, I'm part of that routine. Well, Mr. Leggett is a man of the utmost integrity, I assure you, mm -hmm. and a valued customer. Well, now, you just loaned him these diamonds as a, uh, oh, for an experiment, right? Yes. When Mr. Fitzstephan told me of the legged patterns and coloring glass, it occurred to me that he might have some luck in improving the color of inferior diamonds. It's Mr. Fitzstephan, is that Owen Fitzstephan, the writer? You know Mr. Fitzstephan. Oh, hell yes. I didn't even know he was back in town. Yeah, we used to drink out of the same bottle together. We were studying fake mediums. He wanted to put them in a book. I'm going to put him in jail. Listen, do you have his phone number? My God. Hamilton. <laughs> Owen. I thought rot gut, nicotine, and wild women would have claimed you by now. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no. When I die, it's going to... You're going to have to beat my liberty death with a stick. Oh. Thank you. Very chic. You haven't changed a bit. You surly, crude, rude rascal, you. Man, I wish I could find something nice to say about you, you black Irishman. I like your dress. <laughs> How you been? Despondent, lonely, desperate, paranoid. Absolutely first rate for a writer of macabre books designed to bring a little gloom into people's lives. And you, you, are you still mucking about in crime? Yes, it's just a job, Owen. It's just a job. Now, don't say that, Hamilton. You know how I detest humility. A little libation? Indeed, yes. Oh. <laughs> You do bring back fond memories. To a bathtub still in every home. To the 18th Amendment. I was in the home of your a reader yesterday and saw the copy of The Pale Egyptian. Don't be deprecatory, Hamilton. I do have respectable sales. <laughs> I never see any of your books. Why don't you ever send me any? Because I never know where you are. Yes, I did read a review. It said, uh, a prime example of authorial degeneracy. <laughs> hmm. 
what about the leggings? What? The leggings where I found this book yesterday. He had a handful of diamonds swiped from his laboratory. I was there on a, an insurance claim. Oh, God, that boring, pretentious jeweler will be furious with me now. Oh, no, he thinks you're quite a fine, refined gentleman. He gave me your phone number. Oh, well, then, all's right with the world. I don't know. What do you know about the, uh, the leggings? Oh, a little. I pry, you know. Yes, I know. We have one or two mutual friends. I've endured a few evenings at their home, engaged in abstract conversation. I must confess, Hamilton, I do not have taste for other eccentrics. I prefer to feel unique. So, Edgar Leggett is an eccentric, eh? Edgar Leggett. Underneath that detached scientific exterior is a very complex man. Yes, his daughter doesn't seem to like him much. Oh, a very troubled woman. Strange chemistry. The father adores her. Paradoxically, Mrs. Leggett is a serene, sane soul. I've often wondered what she thinks of these two weird creatures that are her daughter and husband. There's a struggling young banker named uh, Eric Collinson. Do you know him? Struggling, indeed. The youngest son of the Lumber Collinsons. Old Hubert is worth millions. Eric and Gabrielle are engaged to be married. At least I think so. So does he. Mm. He's totally devoid of dimension. Stocks and bonds, polo and Princeton, handball. A nice boy, Chevalier Bayard, you know. Well, if he's not after her money, the whole relationship doesn't make any sense at all. Oh, Hamilton, you're such a sophomore romantic. Eric's strange attraction to Gabrielle is the only thing that makes him faintly interesting. <laughs> yes, opposites attract. Very much like you and I, Hamilton. What do you mean? Well, you love the sound of running feet down dark alleyways, the sudden burst of gunfire, the smell of smoke drifting over the satisfactory conclusion of some gamey pursuit. Can I have another drink? I'm making it sound really neat. <laughs> mm. Well, I am a sedentary vampire, painting ghoulish images with my pen to imprison within the pages of a book. A touch, a touch. Mm -hmm. Now, what about this girl, Gabrielle? She's cuckoo, isn't she? Well, are you saying that carelessly, or do you really believe that she's off? I don't know. She has those strange, shifting, pale green eyes that keep changing back and forth from green to brown, and never deciding on what color to be. She has a, a... Ah, the hell with her. You play this thing? Well, of course I do. Do. Shifting green eyes. Is that a little poetry I hear coming from Hamilton Nash? Owen laughed at me. I couldn't blame him. A surly, crude, rude rascal like me standing there talking about the color of a girl's eyes. The funny thing was, I couldn't get her eyes out of my mind. Next morning, I had to explain to the old man why you should convince the insurance company to keep us on the Leggett case for another day. Well, what you're telling me, Ham, is that you come up empty so far. You keep smoking those things, and you'll never live long enough to take over my job. Yes, Listen, you'll never get me in that chair. I'm not going to end up a money-grubbing, nasty, miserable old man. Now, don't change the subject. Um, our guard just called. Seems your little diamond heist has turned into a homicide. He's got a stiff on the floor that he'd like to share with you. I thought we agreed no bodies. You agreed. I never interfere with nature. It's a one thing. By the time I arrived, the crowd had already gathered. Jack Santos, reporter for the Courier, was the only face I recognized. 
He was one of my best friends and one of my worst enemies. Hi, Jack. Ah, I thought you were in Cleveland. Good news travels fast. Did you write that garbage about the vice commissioner? It's in 1928, Ham. Life is a fantasy. <laughs> What's going on here? You always get it backwards. You're supposed to go in. When you come out, I ask you what happened. You're dying to tell me now what? Some guy got shot. Prime suspect, man with long nose. Long nose? Long nose. Uh, something to do with diamonds, third floor. What do you do in here? Oh, you know, it's the same old thing. Excuse me. Hello. Remember me? The police have found the man. He's lying in there dead. I hope, Mr. Nash, that you are convinced now that Minnie had nothing to do with it. Hey, is that the man that you, uh, you saw with Eric that night? Funny. That night I saw his face under the street light. He was already dead. I could tell. Gabrielle, come. Sergeant O'Gar and I had been inviting each other to murders for years. He's one of the honest cops in this city. Oh, uh, why don't we quit and buy a fishing lodge up in Yeah, that's a great idea. Listen, I understand we have a mutual interest in the corpse. Depends. Who is he? Well, his name is Louis Epton. Labels say San Francisco, but who knows? I think we got a lead on the guy that nailed him because uh, the people on the floor below spotted a guy with a long nose flying down the fire escape about an hour ago, right after the shot. Yeah, well, that's what happens when people stop trusting each other. So I figure long nose took off with the diamonds, but he left the envelopes. How many are there? Seven. And yeah, one's missing, the one they use for the plant. What plant? Now yeah, there's always a loose end. You know that, Agar. Come on, what are you trying to do? You trying to stretch this out to pad your feet? <laughs> it's a simple heist, Ham. Two guys case the Leggett house. Long Nose decides to make a one-way split with the diamonds. He shoots his partner, runs off with a glass. Yeah, everything is perfectly logical, that you say. I'm not going to listen to you, Ham. Except I don't believe there was a burglary. Which means we're going to have to find out why Mr. Upton of San Francisco lies here as a dead body. Your turn, Pat. Why doesn't he ever take his turn? Because you leave him speechless. Well, in that we do have this mutual interest in this body here. Would you run a check on him for me, please? No, I'm going to run a check for me, and by this afternoon, I'll have his life history. Is that soon enough? Oh, no, no, take your time. I'm patting my feet. Bye, Pat. That afternoon, I dropped by the police station. It used to be called the Hall of Justice. I'm glad they changed it. The only justice I ever saw here was the time the guy shot his wife's lawyer in the hallway. All right, you're both under arrest for impersonating officers. Ignore him, he'll go away. Well, I'm not going away until you pay me that six bucks you owe me from that poker game the other night. You got a warrant? You got that information on Upton, our San Francisco corpse? Yeah. I'm delighted to tell you that he used to be a private eye just like you. <laughs> on a little respect. Yeah, he had his own agency in San Francisco until 23 when uh, he and a guy by the name of Harry Rupert. Harry Rupert? Yeah. Got sent over for trying to fix a jury. It's typical, huh? <laughs> Listen, Pat, how about uh, a little lift downtown to my office, huh? Hey, wait a minute. This is not a taxi cab service, you know? I give up. What is it? 
I just sent a wire to the home office. They're gonna put a check on that Rupert guy. He may be the one that came down the fire escape. Okay, I'll see if the insurance company will go for another day. Well, here's what I got. The marriage license files at the municipal building show an application by Edgar Leggett and Alice Dane dated August 26, 1923. Leggett listed Atlanta, Georgia as his birthplace and stated this was his second marriage. Alice Dane's statement indicates no previous marriage. What does that make your little girl, Gabrielle? I don't know. We'll have to ask Foley. Foley. Huh? Oh, oh, thanks. I looked up that Mrs. Begg, Leggett's housekeeper, back from the time when he lived there alone. Well, she said that this Alice Dane woman came as a complete surprise to Edgar Leggett. Ooh, good. I like complete surprises. What else did she say? One day in the pouring rain, this Dane woman shows up with a kid looking like a couple of drowned rats and asking to see her boss. When he came down the stairs and caught sight of him, he turned white as a sheet. What the hell is going on here? Simple burglary, and all of a sudden we got dead bodies, illegitimate kids, and crooked private eyes. That no, job doesn't pay anything. It might as well be interesting. This, what about assigning Mickey and Foley to Minnie Hershey? Where are you going on vacation? No, there's a guy with a long nose running around up there. I'd like to find him and ask him why he kills his friends. Gabrielle is missing. What do you mean, missing? I tried to call. I went out there. The legates just say that she went out of town, but she didn't. Well, no, she didn't. You're not her husband yet. Will you listen to me? I thought Minnie Hershey might know where she went, so I went out there. Minnie told me she hadn't seen Gabrielle. Yeah, what am I going to tell you? Len, please, wait. Minnie was wearing an emerald ring. It's Gabrielle's. I know it is. They probably killed her, stolen her jewelry. It's all your fault, and you've got to find her. It's all your fault. Would you take some advice? You run around town saying things like that, you'll end up with a couple of busted kneecaps. Now go home. Take a nap. You're not going to dissuade me, Mr. Nash. Find her. Find her. I insist that you find her. Now find her. I got an uneasy feeling that I'd messed up somewhere. If Minnie hadn't stolen the diamonds, what was she doing with Gabrielle's jewelry? The news that the girl was missing tied knots in my stomach. This two-bit burglary case had already gotten out of hand. By the time I got to the Liggett house, I figured Gabrielle would be home and I could get on with my business. I figured wrong. All I was getting was a cold reception. Eric is needlessly concerned, Mr. Nash. Gabrielle is with friends in the mountains. I don't know exactly where. Why should the whereabouts of my daughter concern you? Whose daughter is she exactly? Yours or yours? What? Now look here, Mr. Nash. Oh, never mind, never mind. Did either of you have any dealings at all with this Upton, the fellow who was shot? No, none whatever. Why? Well, I think he was shot by his ex-partner, a guy from San Francisco. I'm having our office there get a description for us now. I admire your determination, Mr. Nash. You're very thorough. But I have decided to accept the responsibility for the diamond. Simply make good the loss myself. I think you should. But that won't end the investigation. What do you mean? I mean, there's a body down at the morgue. And I don't let them bury anybody unless I can find something logical to put on the headstone. Fair enough? Dick Foley and Mickey Lenahan were taking turns watching Minnie's apartment to see if any midnight jewelry merchants showed up. It was a tough neighborhood. The sun generally came up on a couple of dead bodies in those dark alleys. A big tough guy stopped me coming in, wanted to know what I was doing here. What'd you tell him? The same thing Ham told that guy in Pittsburgh that time. The Rockefeller sent me out into the neighborhood to give away dollar bills. He took one and went away. <laughs> Anything moving? No. She left the apartment once this morning. Go to the store. I tagged along to make sure that she was buying and not selling. That's it. Minnie Hershey is a real homebody. Do you see any familiar faces from the midnight jewelry business? <laughs> I've been keeping a lookout for Rhino Tingley or even Rigor Mortis Lachlan. 
I wonder what makes him think that the colored maid lifted the legatules. He says that Eric Collinson guy thinks so. Yeah, there's something haywire going out the Liggett house. I need some help. The Liggetts? What's the problem? Did you know the girl was missing? Gabrielle. Yeah, they say she's out visiting friends in the country, don't know where she is or when she's returning, but I think the old lady knows. She's afraid to say anything in front of her husband. Well, that's as it should be. Listen, uh, would you think that you could probably uh, get her alone for a few minutes and uh, find out, if not where she is, why she left? You know what? What? I should have gone into baseball. Yeah? My mom wanted me to be a symphony conductor. They dress so spiffy. I could have been another Grover Alexander. Two wasted lives behind one dirty window. the pitch, Grover. Oh, well, that's Minnie Hershey's door there, the green one. And I guarantee you'll be sick and tired of looking at it after 10 hours. Go on home to your wife and kids. The graveyard shift is here. Well, I'll keep a lookout for Gabrielle Leggett, just in case. What's she look like? Oh, corn to ham. She looks like some kind of a dark angel. But you won't have any difficulty spotting her in this neighborhood. Someday, everybody works 10, 12 hours a day is going to get paid extra. I don't believe all that junk you hear in an election year, Foley. Good night. I'm thinking, wait, Rosie Cross. They know I'm interested in that sort of thing. What the hell's a Rosie Cross? Hamilton, how do you manage illiteracy? I'll go over tomorrow and borrow the book. Oh. Edgar will be at work in the laboratory. I refuse to disturb him. I'll bring some herbal tea and ask her appraisal of it. That way she'll <laughs> never be suspicious. Cash okay. flow, okay. well, don't overdo it. Hello, Dad. Incidentally, I don't play poker very well. Four dollars a month in the poor queen. That's too rich for me. Oh, that is my yeah. <laughs> Sit down, Ann. We'll steal some money from you. Yeah, all right. Meet yeah. my friend here, uh, Owen Fitzstephan. See you later, darling. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> the infamous, famous author and professional pigeons. Have a chair. This is uh, Cam Lou, Jack Santo. All right. Uh, Pat Reddy. Tom O'Brien. Have a chair, Owen. How are you, Cam? Fine. Uh, Nash cheats, you know. Oh, Hamilton, if that's true, I insist that you cheat me also. Andy up. <laughs> Fair enough. The hog shop detail found that Minnie Hersey pawned some nice stuff, just like you guessed. What didn't I guess? Well, the boy showed the items to Mr. Leggett, and he said none of it's theirs. Liggett's a bald-faced liar. The bracelet and the necklace were bought by Liggett for his daughter, Gabrielle. Grant Halstead, a jeweler, told me that, then realized he probably shouldn't have. So what the hell's going on? I'd say put the screws on Minnie Hersey. We just came from there. She's flown the coop. Ah, oh, nonsense. Mickey Linehan did her bustle. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Hello, this is Sergeant O'Gar. Get me, uh, capital 7432. Oh, and for your... Further entertainment. Our San Francisco office confirmed that Mr. Longnose was Upton's partner, Rupert. Upton was going to take a fall alone for that uh, jury tampering thing, he implicated his partner, Rupert, and they both went to prison. Rupert necessarily chagrined, swore that he was going to kill Upton when he got out sometime early this year. I guess he kept his word. Hey, uh, Dick Foley, please. But why did he follow him around two weeks before he did it? If I find him, 
I'll ask him. Hello, Dick. Listen, Mickey Linehan and Minnie Hershey having a picnic somewhere or what? He called in. The gal went visiting. She belongs to some religious cult, Temple of the Holy Grail. The what? Temple of the Holy Grail, Atlantic Avenue. He's got it staked out. I'm going over there now. Uh, well, I'll join you there as soon as I can get there. You got it. Did you find her? She went to get religion. Hello, this is uh, Sergeant O'Gar. Get me Butterfield 3121. Stefan here, would you mind calling back? I'm in the bath. Owen. Oh, oh, Hamilton. Yes, listen, have you been over to the Leggett's yet? Well, I'm on my way. Oh, uh, well, listen, I found out one thing about him. Oh, yes. He lies. Oh. You know a place called the Temple of the Holy Grail? As a matter of fact, I do. Is she there? I don't know, but you might as well ride down with me. Then you won't have to follow me. Harry Collinson bent my ear all the way over to Atlantic Avenue. He didn't like the Temple of the Holy Grail. He didn't like the people who ran it and didn't trust the people who went there. I wanted to shove a gag in his trap. Gabrielle coming here. Yeah, we don't know she is here. That's what we've come to find out. The maid took off, but Foley got here just in time to follow her. You can't here. We're going inside. Okay. There was an eye over the entrance, and I was hoping there was nothing evil connected with it. But hope, as I found out, has nothing at all to do with reality. They kept their religion behind locked doors at the Temple of the Holy Grail. We'll have to take the elevator. Mrs. Haldorn's office is on the second floor. Manuel, is your mother here? You're really good with kids. Mr. Collinson. Mrs. Haldorn, we were wondering if Gabrielle might be here. Yes, she is. But Miss Leggett doesn't wish to see anyone. She's meditating. Or will I, uh... I don't want to be sacrilegious, but... Uh, then don't. Uh, Miss Liggett is a witness in a murder and robbery case. I'm a detective. My name is Nash, and I'd like to talk with her. Fourth floor, turn left, last door on the right. Thank you.
can't do that. She doesn't even know we're here. It wouldn't be decent. Come on, sugar, let's make you decent. If you don't like it, close your eyes. All right. Let's see how this works here. Okay. Arms up. That's a girl. <laughs> we go on through there. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Oh, it's for the. Well, put the. We go. Get the coat over there, Eric. How does this work now? Let's see, we've got kind of a, an Arabic thing here, haven't we? No, no, no. Let's keep it uh, airy. It's a little modest in these. Yeah, just put this on. Come on. Come on. Stay your hat and gloves. Gabrielle never said a word all the way home. Eric just sat back there holding on to her like a paralyzed department store dummy. I felt like a damn chauffeur instead of a detective. When I spotted the house, an alarm bell went off in my head. Something was wrong here. Hamilton. Hamilton. Something terrible has happened. What the hell is going on here, Owen? Edgar Leggett has killed himself. Oh, my God. Owen had given me a shock, but the girl gave me an even bigger one. Her father was dead, and she was smiling. She knew something I didn't, and I was wondering whether even the devil himself might rather be in the dark about it. The house smelled of death. I never get used to it. I'm going to put her to bed. Uh, she's had enough sleep already. Wake her up. Well, that's right, Hamilton. It's too cruel. We're going to find out what happened. I want her up there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Suicide, self-inflicted gunshot wound. There's a Dr. Reese here right now. Listen, you better send a couple of grave diggers with the coroner. Hey, Ham. Ah, uh, don't say it. Don't. Don't say it. All right, there's your missing diamonds. Yeah. And you were right about one thing. There wasn't any burglary. And it's a hell of a way out, but I guess he felt things were closing in on him, you included, and there's his confession. Uh-huh. Go ahead, read it out loud. They might as well all hear about oh, it now. You read it, Owen. I've forgot my glasses. <clears throat> to the police. To the police? To the police. My name is Maurice Pierre de Mayenne. I was born in Fécamp, Department of Seine, en Fayeur, France, on March 6th, 1883, but was chiefly educated in England. In 1903, I went to Paris to study painting and the science of color. There, four years later, I made the acquaintance of Alice and Lily Day. Orphan daughters of a British naval officer. I married Lily the following year. In 1908, our daughter Gabrielle was born. Shortly after my marriage, I discovered I made a most horrible mistake. That it was Alice and not my wife Lily that I really loved. It was a fatal mistake. A most painful time, but Gabrielle was only a baby and I remained silent about my love for Alice. The years slowly passed. When Gabrielle was nearly five, I told Lily of my love for Alice. I asked for a divorce. She refused. We argued bitterly. I lost all control of myself, and on June 6, 1913, I killed Lily. I fled to London with Alice and little Gabrielle, but our life together was brief. I 
I was soon arrested and returned to Paris. I was tried and found guilty as I knew I would be. I was sentenced to life imprisonment on Devil's Island. <laughs> All this is a matter of record in Paris. In 1917, I escaped from the island on a flimsy raft. But the past was not dead. Alice had employed private detectives, Upton and Rupert. They traced me to America. I was reunited with Gabrielle, and Alice and I were married. Some years passed, and I believed I was safe. But seven days ago, Upton came to me demanding money and threatening to expose me. I gave him the diamonds as part payment and reported it as a robbery. But I was desperate. I knew he would never let up and that I would have to kill him. <laughs> Rupert, however, intervened. He found Upton and murdered him himself, fleeing with the diamonds. Rupert stepped into Upton's role as extortionist, returned the diamonds and demanded money in their stead. I killed him. His body is in the cellar. <laughs> Detectives are busy everywhere inquiring into my affairs. There is a little chance of the past being kept secret. I am not going back to Devil's Island. My wife and daughter had neither knowledge of nor part in Rupert's death. Signed, Maurice Day, Mayenne. Incredible. Incredible. The coroner's here, Sergeant. Yeah. And I found that grave in the cellar. There's some men looking at it now. Listen, you better take the rest of the stuff to the coroner, Pat. Hand me the coat. Now, what the hell are you doing? Did you look in these pockets? Don't you bother to check clothing anymore? Damn. It's lucky you found that. I'd hate to think of the temptation that'd give the coroner's crew. Huh. Must be $15,000, then. Did Liggett leave any other messages? No. I'd say that that is enough, wouldn't you? Well, that letter's the biggest bunch of nonsense I've ever heard in my life. Suicide. He was murdered. Oh, now, wait what? Minute. Ham. Ham, what the hell are you talking about now? I thought someone owed it to the dead man to tell the truth. He didn't kill himself. He was murdered. I was sure of it. But I wasn't exactly sure which one in that room would have to pay for it. When I finally opened up and said that Leggett had been murdered, Everyone looked at me like I was crazy. I don't understand you, Ham. The letter was written in his own hand. What more do you want? Well, I believe that part about the prison and his escape from Devil's Island. I could see that in his eyes. You could also see that he was a man who loved his wife and child so much that the only final note he left was directed to the police. No! No! She, she did it! She killed my father! I saw her in the kitchen with a knife. She killed him. No, she's distraught. Uh, the shock. I'll give her a sedative. No, you won't give her anything. Well, you can see it's illusionary reaction. She's not I, suffering I, from I, illusions. Oh, see here. Mr. Leggett was killed by a bullet from that pistol, slanting up. Clearly, uh, suicide. That's right, Ham. Oh, who says? There's nothing in this letter that says he killed himself. Not one damn word where he said, I'm, I'm not going back to Devil's Island. He was going someplace, all right but not to eternity. Yeah, that's why he wrote that letter, to protect his wife and child. Oh, haven't you done enough? Yeah, only it sounded enough like a suicide note for someone to kill him. Oh, no. No, can't you make him stop? I told you, I, I was downstairs and I heard some kind of explosion and I came upstairs and... He was lying there dead. <laughs> and then... Then I heard the front door bell, and I went downstairs, and it was Mr. Fitzstephen. <laughs> no, 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 that's true, Hamilton. She was speechless. I had to call the police. And the rest is in the letter. Oh, to hell with the letter. 
It's a fairy tale. Make a story about paying a blackmailing Upton with these diamonds. It's pure rubbish. I'm a little insulted. I mean, he would never be foolish enough to risk giving someone else's diamonds away. He'd I mean, pay him off with cash. He had bushels of it. No, I don't think Upton came to your husband at all, Mrs. Leggett. I think he came directly to you. Oh! You took the diamonds to pay Upton off. Made it look like a burglary even to leaving a diamond lay on the stoop as if some escaping thief had dropped it. <laughs> so when Rupert came looking for Upton, he came directly to you. You told him about the diamond. Big mistake. He thought he had a gold mine here. He found Upton, bang, went into business himself, got the diamonds, found out what they were really worth, came back through the ice in your face, demanding more, much more. That's what Gabrielle saw in the kitchen. She saw you stabbing Rupert. She thought you were killing her father. Now she must have been doped up on something. What have you been giving her? What, laudanum, morphine, whatever. Then she took the jewels, gave them to Minnie to raise some cash on, and went to hide out in the Temple of the Holy Grail. And you had one hell of a mess on your hands, didn't you, Mrs. Leggett? Then you went to see your husband, told him the whole terrible story, and he wrote that letter protecting you and Gabrielle just before he left. Are you quite finished with this absurd amount of, of, of cruelty? No, 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 not quite. <laughs> There's a hell of a love story in there, isn't there? Do you like it? Two orphan sisters on the make for the same eligible bachelor. Now, there's a book in there someplace, Owen. But I've smelled enough gun smoke on men's clothing to know that Edgar Leggett was no murderer. A martyr? A martyr. A martyr with a capital M. You were the one that decided that he'd married the wrong sister. Weren't you, Mrs. Leggett? You took measures to rectify that mistake. You know how I know that? Matter of record, you were arrested along with him for the murder in London. But you let him take the fall, didn't you? So he went to prison. And then he escaped from prison, and you traced him here with Upton and Rupert. And surprised him one rainy afternoon with Gabrielle in tow. And with a threat of exposure hanging over his head, you forced him to marry you. You're wrong, Mr. Nash. Oh, you're extremely clever to a point, but you are wrong. Am I? You see, it was Gabrielle who murdered her mother. I taught her to. Please, Mrs. Lennon, Be you're quiet, Doc. You remember, Gabrielle, dear? You remember the little game we used to play? The lovely little game in your mother's bedroom. Do you remember? We used to... use the gun, but it didn't have anything in it, did it? And you used to come into the room and I would pretend to be sleeping. And you would pull the trigger. And I would wake up and you would laugh and laugh. It went very well, didn't it? Those rehearsals. And then the day came when your Auntie Alice wasn't there. No, I was downstairs entertaining friends. mother was sleeping in her bedroom, but the gun was loaded now. But your father came home unexpectedly. Of course, Edgar took the blame on himself. hard to convince you you were only five and you were strange even then. But you did it. It was ordained that you kill her. 
No. You're her daughter. You carry the Dane curse. You're cursed with the same oh. black and evil soul that we all are. And you're cursed with the blood of your mother on your hands from baby. Oh. Oh. Don't move! Oh, shoot! Don't you move! When she saw there was no escape, Alice Leggett turned the gun on herself. Damn it to hell, I hope you're proud of the way your work gets done. Gets done. Owen wasn't used to the sound of gunfire and the sight of blood. I thought he was going to pass out before I could thank him for saving my life. Alice Leggett was a very logical woman. Evil, lustful, but nonetheless logical. By the way, you were brilliant in there. Absolutely astounding. It was a remarkable exhibition of deductive thinking. You don't actually believe that I think. Alice Leggett killed her husband, you. Now, don't rattle me, Hamilton. You always do that to me, and I find it quite tiresome. Oh, oh, oh no, you don't. You find it fascinating. You love it, Owen. Don't forget the girl. Damn it, Hamilton. You are determined to think that this girl is somehow involved in all of this. Yep. But you said yourself you place no stock in the Dane curse. All we have so far is the word of a dead woman that Gabrielle was actually rehearsed to kill her mother. Ah, Gabrielle, is it? Mm-hmm. I have never detected a glimmer of paternal instinct in you, Hamilton. Are you sure it isn't a bit more of a carnal nature? Hmm? You black Irish git. <laughs> I'm old enough to be her father. Mark, just continued on that Liggett file if you want to, but it's not over. Well, it's over with us when the fee stops, Ham. No client, no case. No dicky, no shirty, huh? Well, that's what the Chinese told me. From now on, the girl will have to look out for herself, Ham. Yeah, well, that's all right with me. It'll be nice to get next to a nice, sane, warm female again. Well, worse things could happen. You could get married again. You know, I always lie when we come to your confessionals. Well, Foley's married. Mickey's married. Foley's married. Mickey's wife is married. Your play. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. All these years saying your wife ran away with the Iceman. <laughs> well, it's been fun knowing something you don't. Tell me. You are really a granny, aren't you? You get a rocking chair and sit out on a porch so you can get your thrills sticking your nose in everybody's business. Play. Well, this is my front porch. This is my rocking chair. Ham. Did she really run away with the Iceman? <sighs> yeah. You know what she finally said to me? She says, Ham. You should marry a car. Then you can trade her in every year on a new model or so. Speaking of cars. <laughs> I knew that would get you back to work. Yeah, I'd like to have you run up to the mountains. There's a guy up there who thinks his employees are jipping him. Dope's all, right. all there. And then you'll get a little fresh air and get this mess out of your mind. Do you good. case was over. 
but something pulled me back. I told myself it was just a feeling this was unfinished business. But maybe it had something to do with a girl and a curse. I was headed up the mountain to investigate some petty thievery from a company payroll. Gabrielle was on her way back to the Temple of the Holy Grail. Don't you worry none now, Miss Gabrielle. You'll be all right. I'll be here with you, okay? My child, let the spirit flow through you, through your body through every fiber of your body, through every thread of your spirit, my children. Now you are at peace, at one with God, Mr. Cabot. I see you. I see you at peace with God. Gabrielle! Come back to us. I am so happy. This is where you belong, Gabriel. You'll see. Nothing can hurt you here. I called you back to town because it looks like the Leggett case is active again. I don't give an old pro that poker face routine of yours. No. I know you've been aching to take a look at that girl again, even if it kills you. Anyway, her lawyer called me, Madison Andrews, and uh, he was very impressed the way you handled the Leggett matter, blah, blah, blah. I think Aaron Collinson um, pressured him into hiring us. Now, <clears throat> here's a note from Andrews explaining your presence at the temple to that high priest as uh, Aronia Haldron. Yeah, it was somebody who could explain her presence to me. What? No, nothing, nothing. Now, you're just there to keep an eye out. Remain in the background, no chummy chummy, and in no way interfere with anything unless the girl seems to be in danger. You got that? I got it. You couldn't hide much from the old man. I did want to see her again. And the thought of getting killed for it never crossed my mind, which, of course, it should have. Mickey gave me a lift to the Temple of the Holy Grail. He was trying to entertain me, but my mind wasn't on it. See, he wasn't a husband at all. He was the boyfriend who had hired us to check out in his girlfriend's relations with her husband. <laughs> Would you believe that? Make a fine cab driver, Mickey. <clears throat> you know the city, and your mouth runs like a meter. Thanks for the thought. Thanks for the lift. See you in charge, Chuck. Drive carefully. <laughs> I got my first look at Joseph, who played God in this place. His flock included some faces I'd seen in the society pages, the kind of people who could afford to pay the rent on this layout. Well, well, Mr. Nash. You're back.
How nice to see you again. Thank you. I believe you have a letter for me from Madison Andrews. Yes. We will try to make you as comfortable as possible. Thank you. You will find surprisingly, perhaps, that we are neither barbarians nor fanatics here, Mr. Nash. This is a temple, but none of us supposes that civilized living or happiness or comfort will desecrate it. We don't expect you to join, naturally. However, one never knows. I do ask, however, that you show us the same consideration we will display toward you. You may come and go as you wish. You may attend our services or not. I assume you are a man of certain curiosity, but I'm sure you will not interfere with anything you may see, no matter how peculiar, so long as it does not promise to affect you or your... our sister, Miss Leggett. Fair enough. Would you like to see the letter? No, I... Uh, I trust you. I have my instructions. I'll show you to your room. Let your concentration become more specific now. Mr. Cabot, I want you to think of it in terms of something very, very specific. Come, sister. Not generalized, but something deep within inside you. A commitment. You must make a very deep, deep commitment. You now feel the spirit coming to the Miss Leggett is in there, eh? Yes, Dr. Reese is with her now. I'm sure he'll want to see you when he's finished. He was very pleased that you were coming. Mr. Nash. Dr. Reese. I'm very glad you're here. Thank you. No real reason for alarm, of course, but uh, nevertheless, I told Madison uh, it might be well, yes, it might be well. How is Miss Leggett? Well, Mr. Nash, I think we might say that her physical condition is in my sphere, so to speak. Uh, mm. I hope you'll find your part quite boring, in fact. Well, I would like to see her. Oh, my, no, 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 I, I, absolutely not. Uh, better that she doesn't even know you're here. No, might awaken those uh, associations. Uh, she's resting now. Uh, I'll come back after dinner. L looking on her again. Yes. Minnie. Mr. Nash, what you doing here? I've been hired to look after Miss Leggett. How is she? Ain't no need for you to be here. I take care of Miss Gabrielle. Yeah, Minnie, how is she? She's just fine. She's right cheerful today. She's sleeping now. She don't need you no how. Dr. Reese had seemed very worried about Gabrielle. Minnie insisted she was just fine, and there I was. I hadn't been in the temple 10 minutes, and I was already violating my orders to stay out of her room.
I should have stayed there. Everything was too quiet. The kind of quiet you feel just before all hell breaks loose. the idea of unbelievers being around. Let us not forget the true spirit of the Holy Grail. Non-believers breathe the same air as believers. Yeah, well, far be it from me to forget the true spirit, huh? Have you seen Joseph? I seen Joseph. I seen plenty of Joseph, and I don't mind telling you, he's starting to worry me. Mr. Fink, Joseph is a true healer. Don't you forget it. Now, where did you say he was? He's in the chapel with Mrs. Huntoon, and I think he's a little, you know. Thank you. The door acted like it had some mysterious mind of its own. I wanted it open to watch Gabrielle's room. After dinner, Joseph, perhaps we could meditate together, just the two of us. Chapel services are after dinner, Sister Huntu. <laughs> I know. I mean after chapel, of course. I find it hard to relate to you in chapel. Maybe I feel too much like the sister, do you think? We are here to fulfill all your spiritual needs, of course. Oh, I feel spiritually fulfilled. I just thought, you know, in view of my generous contribution. Most gratefully received for the perpetuation of the true spirit. Sure. It's just that when I'm with you, well, you know, I feel a surge, like, like I'd like to be part of you. Sister Huntoon, you are lit with the fire of the giving spirit. Yes, the fire. Let it burn inside you. Oh, yes. Let it consume until your passion is pure. Pure. I will. I promise I will. Go. Go. What will be, will be. Be careful, Joseph. Be very careful. Do not attempt to question the conduct of God, Aronia. I'm not talking about that overheated disciple of yours. I'm talking about the girl. The girl will be with me in paradise. Do you know what you're doing? Fear no evil, for I am with you. You'll destroy it. I'm warning you, you'll destroy it all.
of when it started to hit me, or what it was. The night started to smell sick, sweet. Some kind of music started to force its way into my brain. I could hardly open my eyes. It's like my eyelids weighed a ton apiece. My body looked like it was a mile long. I had to get out of there. What's the matter with you? Are you drunk? Eric. Eric. What are you doing here? Dr. Reese sent for me. He said that there was an urgent message he wanted to give me. I couldn't find him, so I came here. Easy, easy. Where's Gabrielle? Easy, Where Kitty. is she? Easy, kid. Easy, well, What's easy. the matter with you? Where is she? Well, they drugged me or something. Well, what's the matter with you? Where is she? See, there's a, there's a stair right here. Yes, right here. Come on. were clear, bright, calm, just as if she expected to find me there. You found me. I 
I knew you would. One day. I killed him. You're a detective. Take me. Take me where they'll hang me. Gabby. No! No! Don't you touch me! Didn't you hear me? I already killed him. I heard her all right. She looked real. The dagger in my hands felt real. If I wasn't still dreaming, I had just let Gabrielle kill somebody. A simple assignment, muffed, my fault. Getting old, damn this business, damn her. I almost said it out loud. The dangers. We took Gabrielle back to Casada and put her in a room next to mine. News of her rescue or capture, depending on which newspaper you read, spread fast. Casada's main street became a carnival midway by the next morning. Freaks. When are you leaving? When it's over. I think this affair is beginning to affect your mind. <laughs> yeah, you may be right. But I'll tell you one thing, Owen. When I find my man a woman, it's going to be somebody who's ready for the madhouse, not the governors. Oh, Hamilton, that's beneath you. Because you've been outwitted, it must be a lunatic. <laughs> Nothing's beneath me. But it must have occurred to you who, lunatic if you like, is closest to that girl in that room. The person who's the most unbalanced that's close to Gabrielle is within Gabrielle herself. Hamilton, forget about the curse. The girl is hopeless for a myriad number of reasons. Dope, a tragic, early, sordid start into life, whatever. Now, please, pack that battered Gladstone bag of yours and come away with me while you're still alive. Do it for me, Hamilton. Mr. Fink. Well, you perform some magic on those jailhouse doors or something, have you? No magic, Mr. Nash. Justice, that's what. No call to keep me in jail. I seen that. Well, come in. Uh, Owen Fitz Stephen, meet Mr. Fink. He's the genius that's responsible for all of that mechanical madness at the Temple of the Holy Grail. How you do, sir? How do you do? Look, Mr. Nash, I got something important I gotta talk to you about. Just take a second. Maybe in the hall, just a sec. Uh. This kidnapper, Harv Wooden, got shot. Hey, what about him? I oh, just thought you ought to know. Harv Wooden was...
I couldn't see the door to my room split open or the floors or walls and ceiling wiggling like the end of the world. The noise was too loud to hear. I only felt it like a giant ache in my bones. I could sense I moved. Back in my room, Owen laid there, torn by the blast. The bed was burning, the window and screens were gone. I felt something over my shoulder. Maria! Ah! No! Owen's right side had caught the full blast. The thought kept ringing in my head. Another one. God, another one. What happened? Get down here. Get it up! Get up! What happened here? Yeah, what the hell happened here? What happened here? The DA told the old man that something like this was bound to happen. You all was in some kind of trouble. Mickey told me that the old man had talked the DA into springing Tom Fink and Aroni Haldron from jail yesterday afternoon. Hal Mason had followed Aronia. Mickey had been tailing Tom Fink. Went from the Who's Go to a hotel on Stone Street, checked into his room, then left. He went to the library, where he spent the rest of the afternoon reading the newspaper files on your little girl's troubles. Then what? Back to his room and camped there all night. You sure he didn't backdoor you? I don't know. Might have. I stopped at midnight so as to be on the job at six. But he took the early morning rattler from town to Porter City, straight here. Easy, now. He went to the hotel, asked for you. That's it. What do you say about all this now, Nash? There's a bomb expert that works for the city police named McCracken. See if you can't get him down here tonight. Just a second now. I think... Use your charm. That doesn't work. Use my name. There's a doctor. What about him? You gonna live? Oh, that one, he's, he's all right. He's dazed, bruised. But, but the other one, damn my soul, he's still alive. I couldn't believe that Owen, or the half of him that was left, was still alive. I doubted he'd make it over to the hospital in Porter City. McCracken was the city's expert on bombs. He was the best. He'd agreed to come to Casado on a misunderstanding. He thought I'd been blown up. A tender gesture, and it irritated me some that he looked a little disappointed. You got nine lives, Ham. I hope you keep in count. Oh, boy, will you look at this. Oh, I'm back on a job. Huh? Who pulled his chair? You're not a job, you're a career. What's the verdict? Small bomb, Ham, aluminum case of some kind, charged with a low grade of nitroglycerin. That's N I T R. All right, all right, McCracken, and I, so I spelled your name wrong once. <laughs> Amateur or professional? Both. Both. Oh, yeah. Materials were crude, but the results are first rate. I'd say whoever did it really knew his stuff, but he had to work with whatever he could lay his hands on. Well, that sure doesn't help us much, does it? I'll know better maybe when I take a look at it all in the lab. Would you say there was a timing device used? No sign of one, no. Let me check. This Ben, I think it might be wise to put a, one of your deputies outside of Fink's hospital room over at Porter City. Why? So he doesn't wake up and take a walk. But you said yourself he was standing out there on the porch with you. Yeah, it's a little too perfect, isn't it? Will Owen die? Fitz Stefan. I don't know. His body's so badly damaged that if he lives, he probably wish he hadn't. I don't know. That should be even more satisfactory. 
for the curse, that is. Gabrielle, there's no curse. Look! Teeth marks. Ah. I did that. I did that, didn't I? Oh, it's, well, it's nothing to worry about. Thanks. No, don't forgive! Look at it! See it! You know, some, some dames are really cute when they get mad. You get ugly as hell. That's it. That's it. I bring out the worst in men. Not trying. I never try. But all of them. Horrible. You bring out the worst in Eric? No. No. Eric, he... He never behaved badly around me, not Eric. The fact is, you're still a virgin, aren't you? <laughs> I don't know what the world's coming to. I, you, you compliment a, a lady and she slaps you for an insult. like you were spying inside my soul. No, 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 no. Nothing so mysterious at all. No. Separate rooms on a honeymoon. I'm a detective, remember? Well, you're not a very good one. Well? If you were, you could tell me why. Why everybody close to me and near me, everyone that has anything to do with me dies. Tell me. Tell me about me. Make believe I'm all right. You can be all right, Gabrielle. Gabrielle, you can be all right. If you do exactly as I say, How much of that morphine you use a day? No, I can't. That's the price. No! This was the beginning. I heard her start to cry. Her sobs went straight through me like a knife. I hadn't called the old man, and it was just a matter of time before he got mad and started raising hell. Well, bodies are just routine to him. Yeah, yeah, brother, yeah. Well, if you can't find him at the hotel, would you see if you have a listing for a cat? Uh, operator, yeah. Well, well, see if you have a listing for a billiard parlor in that jerk water town. First, you wanted to know if you were still alive. And if you're still alive, why haven't you called? And if you're alive and haven't called, what the hell is going on up here? He's worried about that, huh? Dollar forty? How come you never play him? Four good reasons, a wife and three kids. I told the old man you'd locked yourself in the bathroom and I'd ask you when you got out. Fair enough. Well, all right for the time being. Al Mason tracked your high priestess, Aronia Haldorn, to somebody's house in Allendale. I hear they let Aronia Haldorn and Tom Fink loose because they threatened to talk. Just the opposite, Jack, as usual. Henry. 
70? Shark. Oh, it just seems that way to a fish in a barrel. Ham. We turn that girl over to a keeper and get the hell back to civilization. She's not ready for that. Not ready? What's going on with you two, anyway? Careful. That's what I've got a cue in my hand. I mean it, Ham. Come on! You are a little old for her, aren't you? Just because she's only got 50 cards in her deck doesn't mean... Shut up! Hey, 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 friendly game, huh? Come on, here. Shoot. Sorry. It's the gin talking, okay? Jin is right. And it's been a long day. I drove Gabrielle back to the Tooker place in the morning. She never said a word the whole way. Just us. Come on. I tried to kill myself here. A gun. So no more people would die. No one's going to die. Come on. still here? No, I had them moved out. Only your things, your clothes, everything's straightened up. It's all right, Gabrielle. Come on. Come on. Maria? Gabrielle's coming up. Hello, Mickey. Uh -huh. Tell her what happened to the poor girl up in Poisonville who thought she could trust you. <laughs> What's happening over at Port City? Did you see Owen? Uh, he's not good, but he's going to make it. And your friendly bomber, Tom Fink, is awake and uh, denying everything. Doesn't know anything about a bomb, says the sheriff. Uh, doesn't know any harm wooden. They've got a deputy sheriff guarding his door, though. Yeah, well, Tom fix our man, all right. Somehow, he's... What did the sheriff say? Ah, uh, he's got it all figured out. <laughs> you set the girl up for a chain of murder and extortion. <laughs> You've made quite an impression up here, lad. Did I think I'll run over to Porter City and see Fink? Yes, Gabrielle. Please come here. Oh, driving around in a Pierce Arrow. And now it's Mr. Nash. Now listen, Mickey, I want you to act respectful to me when Mrs. Collinson's around. I know that'll be tough for you, but it's absolutely necessary that she believes that I'm the answer to her prayers. OK. I can't put on an act like that sober, Mr. Nash. Hello. You promised me morphine. You promised. And you're just standing down there talking. Who's your friend? Oh, that's Mickey Linehan. He works with me. He'll be here all the time. How much of that stuff do you have left around here? You promised. Yeah, I know I promised. I just haven't had a chance to pick any up yet. I will. But it's not only the morphine, Gabrielle. I told you that- Don't forget! Come on. 
You're okay. You're all right, aren't you? Sure, oh, you're okay. When? When will you get it? Listen, Gabrielle, you have to trust me. You've got to rip this monkey off your back. You have to believe me. Otherwise, it's too tough. Now, it's what you want, isn't it? Yes. I can do it, can I? Yes, you can do it, of course. No, no, I mean, you said it. I really could do it. You can do it, Gabrielle. Now, come on. But it'll be awful, won't it? Yeah, it'll be awful. But I'll be with you all the time. Leave me alone for a while. Yeah, sure. No, I mean... Not for long, just... Just for a little while. All right, for a little while. I tried to shut out the feelings of pity I had for her. She'd be screaming for her life in 48 hours. I only hoped to God I could go through with it. I was convinced that Harv Whidden killed Eric, and maybe Tom Fink could tell me why. My name's Nash, the National Detective Agency. I'm Mr. Fink. I ain't supposed to let you in, Mr. Nash. Oh, come on. I could have walked down here with an orderly's coat and a bedpan in my hand, walked right by, you wouldn't know the difference. But I'm trying to play it by the book, just like Sheriff Finney would like. Now, here, you take your gun, point it at me. If I make a false move, shoot. Got it? Okay. Uh, you know how the safety works? Nash, you no, just... No, 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 don't, don't point it at the patients, all right? Listen, by the way, uh, you know where I can get a couple of bottles of gin? Try the elevator boy over at the courthouse. Thank you. Look, Nash, you gotta help me get out of this place. Feeling all right? Sure I am. That's just the point. They're keeping me here. It sounds like I had something to do with that bombing or something. Oh. <laughs> Look at me. Do well, I look like a bomber to you? And if you were a bomber, you'd got a hell of a disguise. <laughs> All right, now listen. Uh, just before the explosion, you said you had something to tell me about Harv Whitten, but Sheriff Feeney said you didn't know who he was. Now, he's stubborn, but he's not dumb. Yeah, sure. It's none of his business. Well, what about Harv Whitten? It's probably nothing. He, he was my stepbrother. Yeah. So? So nothing. I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen him in more than a year. I don't understand. Why did you take a train all the way up here just to tell me that? Because I'm clean, that's why. Because I'm clean. Look, the newspapers are making some kind of connection about what happened with Eric Collinson and what happened up there at the temple. And then this cop, what's his name? O'Gar. Yeah. He said that, that you thought I knew more than I was telling. So I, I just wanted to come up here and show you I ain't got nothing to hide. That's why I come up here. Mm -hmm. Look, can't you get me out of here, Nash? Yeah, yeah, I think I can. I think I can help you. Oh. Just, just lay down and relax. Yeah, OK. Yeah, just, well, just lay down and rest. Yeah. Yes, I'll see what I can do. Thanks. Oh, this one. All right, the uh, elevator operator over the courthouse. I can't hold Fink on the strength of some vague speculation, Nash. You've got the president and general manager of vague speculation right here taking notes. All right, Jack. Me, ma'am, I'm just trying to get some truth for the afternoon edition. Well, Fink's your man. Now, get him out of that hospital and lock him up before he works some sleight of hand on that deputy you've got down there. Deputy Scalf is a good man. Yeah, he's probably a relative, too. He couldn't keep air in his sack. Listen, will you lock him up if I file a complaint? Now, you said yourself. You were there when Fink came into the room. You saw nothing. He's a magician's mechanic, Ben. You're not supposed to see anything. He can make tigers disappear from cages. 
Pigeons come out of teacups. Who is this fella? Oh, uh, I'm Tom Vernon. I'm the district attorney. I'm sorry, Tom. Never had one this. Sorry. Oh, how do you do? Uh, sorry. Well, at least, uh, at least lock him up until we find out if, if Owen lives. He may have seen something in there. You ask for a lot, but you don't give much, Nash. Damn it, Ben. I'm giving you my opinion. That's all I've got. How come you're still hiding that girl up at the Tucker place? If I'm hiding her up there, how do you know about it? Never mind that. What are you up to? I'm trying to cure her of her morphine addiction. <laughs> oh, that... You can't cure those dopies. That's impossible. Gentlemen. Excuse me, I have an important engagement. I'm going to see your local bootlegger. It's none of my business, Sheriff, but uh, I've been a Nash watcher for years. I'd lock Fink up. Oh, you're right, it's none of your business. And, uh, uh, lock him up. Locked you up and let Fink go. Oh. Not yet. Say, Dick, listen, I want you to take a drive into the city. Go to Vic Dallas's drugstore and pick up a package for me. Be careful of it. What am I being careful of? Oh, 50 grains of morphine, a few doses of calomel, ipecacac, atrophine, strychnine, cascara. Sorry, I asked. <laughs> See you in the morning. Yeah, thanks, Dick. Aham, uh -huh. speaking of packages, did you buy any chance? Ah, uh, that one. Yes. Your gym is in the car. Man does not live by pasta alone. So there I was, deep in the heart of Eureka, trying to pose as a foreigner. Now, nobody had bothered to tell me that little old Eureka contains one specimen of every nationality known on the face of this earth. <laughs> Can you imagine me speaking of the English, trying to pose as a foreigner? In a town festooned with farmers. <laughs> then they went crazy trying to figure out what I was because I couldn't talk. And I... Excuse me. Yes. Well. Gotta make sure we go back in. Eureka, doesn't it? Start your cure the day after tomorrow. No. I've changed my mind. Well, I guess they were all right then. They should have sent you packing. Think I like camping out here without crickets? I'll do it. If you say. Come inside.
I wasn't sure at this point whether she was playing games with me or not. One thing was sure. I had to stay in control. Dick Foley arrived back at the Tooker place bright and early the next morning. He brought the bag of stuff I ordered from Vic Dallas' drugstore. He also brought some bad news. Vic Dallas said to tell you that if anybody dies from that, he doesn't know you. Fair enough. Hang on to that for me, will you? Go have some breakfast. No time, Ham. I gave the old man your message, and he says if the girl is OK and you're satisfied she didn't kill her husband, to hell with what the cops say. Collinson is convinced and ready to pay his bill. We're to pack up and get back. Oh, grand music to the ears, Dick. Finally! Hey, hey, hey. Don't start piping that tune just yet, Mickey. I don't feel so well. I guess I better go back up. Yeah. Oh, uh, listen. I'm gonna have to leave for a while. And, uh, I don't want you walking around unless you have Mickey or Dick with you, all right? Leave. You can't leave. You'll be all right for a while. I'll be back. As soon as I can. The rest. We'll keep it in a safe place. Promise is a promise. Don't you forget it. I promised old Hubert Collinson I wouldn't let go of this case until I found out why his grandson, Eric, was killed. And I was sure that Harv Whitten had committed the murder, but I didn't know why. That was part of the bargain. And I wasn't going to let that rich old guy in there off the hook, not if I could help it anyway. Mr. Nash, I'm convinced that my grandson and his murderer have been laid to rest. It's uh, an ugly chapter of life, and we have to close the book on it. I shall, of course, see to it that Gabrielle gets the best of medical attention. Well, Mr. Nash, you did your job. It's not a matter of expense. It's a matter of carrying on. And now, this has been a long day. Yes, it has been a long day, and I've spent most of it sitting in here, cooling my heels, waiting to see you. I'm wondering right now why I don't tell you and all of this to go to hell. Well, why don't you, if it would make you feel good? Because it wouldn't make me feel good. I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to keep your word. It was a pretty impressive speech you made to me that night that you hired me. At least it impressed me. You said that if I failed to find out why Eric was killed, never to face you again. Well, I'm facing you right now, telling you that I have failed. I thought the matter was firm in your mind. What bothers you? Instinct. You have an instinct. You know something about instinct. It takes more than brawn and luck to sit where you are. Well, instinct is part of my job, and I'm good at my work. Probably just as good at my work as you are at yours in this. See, I know when a job is finished and when it isn't. And my instinct tells me that this one isn't. I want to stand up and face you when it is. Now, I can get off right now. But I'd rather have a ticket at the end of the line. Yeah, there's a blank check. Uh, 
don't fill in the numbers till all the votes are counted. Well, he cut me off cold. What did you use on him? Sure. I'm taking correspondence, of course. Yeah, well, you better practice next in the DA. He's breathing fire because Tom Fink got mixed up in that business of yours, owing something else. Your high priestess, Aronia Haldorn. She gave Al Mason the slip. Watch your step. Yeah. Listen, I'm, uh, I didn't mean to uh, ruin your reputation out the Hall of Justice. I'll, I'll try to make it up to you sometime. Oh, don't worry about it, Ann. <laughs> it's the first time in years my stomach doesn't hurt. Hey, Dick. What's the verdict? Staying. She was in her room all day. She came to the window once or twice. Looking for you, I think. That's all we've seen of her. It's too damn quiet up there. Well, I guess there's no, uh, no sense in me carrying all of this stuff around, then. Here. Lay it over there. No, no. You want him to come and get him. Well, when you're a wrinkled old lady of 25, you'll crawl on your hands and knees across broken glass to get this much stuff. Come on. Take it. I just wanted to hurt you for leaving me alone all day. Congratulations. You succeeded. Listen, Ham. She'll be all right for a while. What are, what are we meddling in this thing for? There's some very good reasons. Well, what are we supposed to do? You're supposed to protect her. From everything and everybody except me. Now, it's going to be very ugly three days, and I don't want any interference from either of you. Understood? Get 
get some sleep. I don't like it. I can't. I can't. I can't. Uh, no, no, no. It hurts my stomach. It hurts my stomach. It hurts me a lot. again with the ride in the merry-go-round it's not the days i mind so much it's the nights can have me.
It won't work, Ham. For years. Sometimes the brain has gone so far. <laughs> Mickey Linehan, please come here. I want to see you. Why don't you go get drunk? Yeah. I had the feeling Gabrielle was getting stronger and I was getting weaker. And I wasn't sure how much longer either of us could last. I forgot what day it was. I was getting numb from tiredness. But the pain for Gabrielle was getting worse. Her nerve ends had been dulled so long by morphine, everything that touched her skin now felt like a hot knife. Every time she woke up, she'd start screaming and try to rip her clothes off. I can't stand this. I can't stand it anymore. Oh, no, it hurts me. Come on. You get out of here. You get out of here. You like this. You like to see this. No, you like it. You like it. Yes, you do. You Come on. do. surprising me. She always had a way of looking unexpected. Her face was a dusky oval between black hat and black coat. But her luminous eyes were real enough. How do you do? Fine, thank you. I'm so glad for Mrs. Collinson's sake that you're here. She and I have excellent proof of your protective ability, haven't we? Well, I'm sorry she can't see you. Uh, she's not well. Oh, but I would like to see her, if only for a moment. Uh, don't you think it might be good for her? No. You're quite mistaken about me, Mr. Nash. Maybe a little bit, not much. Just because you saved my life doesn't entitle you to treat me this recklessly. Well, I'm not interested in you now. First you rebuff me, then you offend me. You're not rebuffed or offended. You're irritated because you're not getting what you came for. Oh? You want to know how close I am to finding the answer to the whole riddle of the Dane curse? I have a certain amount of curiosity, naturally. Not exactly criminal for a woman. Then I'll give you a certain amount of satisfaction so your trip here isn't completely wasted. I know the answer. I knew I'd hit a nerve. But this lady could stand in hot coals and never blink. And she spoke, taking great pains to be understood. Answer me truthfully. Wait. Wait before you answer. I don't want to do an unnecessary wrong. No pretending, no lying. Tell me the truth. Do you know the answer? Yeah. Then there's no use in my fencing with you any longer. No! 
<laughs> you all right, Ham? <laughs> yeah, it's all over. There's no holes in me. Go out and keep your eye on that chauffeur. What now? Nothing now. It's just a big nuisance, you horning in here trying to muddy things up. I'm not interested in that temple racket of yours. Leave it to the courts. They're always kind to sad-eyed dames. Just go home, Aronia, and behave yourself. What's going on here doesn't concern you. You're very deceptive. I underestimated you. Please give my best wishes to Mrs. Collinson. Yeah. yeah. Goodbye, Mr. Nash. Someday. She just tried to put a slug in me, and now she leaves me standing like she dismissed me. I let her walk on ahead so she couldn't see my knees shaking. Why did you let her go? It's because she missed. Because I'm busy. Do something with this. This is very inadvisable. Maybe we should just wait, didn't we? Is it be possible to put it off? I don't know. You told me he came to. Now, I've got to talk to him now, or we, or we may never know. Well... Understand now, no, no duress, no, no pressure. His hold on life is still precarious. I understand, and I appreciate it. Stephan, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mr. Fitzstephan? Sheriff Ben Feeney. You're our only witness. Now, when the bomb went off in that room, did you see anything? Did you hear anything? That's enough. Now, no more. Doctor, please. Class. What's that? No, I can hear you. You heard something? Did you say glass? I heard a tinkle of glass. A small thud. Someone threw something in the window. Uh-huh. Well, now. That's enough. No more. I absolutely insist. Coffee? Give it up, Ham. That girl is turning into a vegetable. 
I have to stay half drunk to keep out our screams. Mm -hmm. I know you're both tired. Why don't you go up? They're tired, hell! This goes beyond morphine. There's some dark force up there you're dealing with. Don't you understand? Dark force? What about you, Dick? How do you feel about that? I don't know about any dark force, but how about a doctor? What do you say, Ham? A doctor? A doctor and a priest. What she needs up there is me. You guys can go to hell. Do it for me. Please. Please do it for me. missing from the kitchen. I think our favorite cook might have tucked it away somewhere. What makes you think that? Well, Dick doesn't have it, and I don't have it. And unless you have it, I'd be careful lest it wind up in your ribs. I don't think Maria Grasso likes the way you've been treating your little baby up there. Well, I guess that makes it unanimous, doesn't it? The last two days had started bad and gone downhill. Gabrielle was still fighting me for morphine, or only Aldorn had tried to shoot me. My partners were ready to free the girl and commit me. I was running out of time. Worse than that, I had to keep fighting with myself, even to care. 
when Sheriff Benvini drove in with a look that said things were going to get worse. I'm turning Tom Fink loose. Well, I guess you've made worse mistakes in your life. Oh, <laughs> not, not this time, Sherlock. Your friend Fitzstephen came too, just long enough to tell me exactly what happened. Owen's awake. Huh? Just enough to knock your theory into a cocked hat. Well, what did he... Fitzstephen says, had he heard the sound of broken glass and a thud on the floor just before the bomb went off. Well, I guess... Which, which means that it came through the window while you and Fink were out in the hall. How do you like them apples, Mr. Detective? Owen told you that. I heard it with my own ears. The tinkle of broken glass. His exact words. Nash! Nash! What the hell is that? It's a glass of milk. Now, you're sure that he said that? Damn sure. Now, I... Listen, I came here to tell you, and I told you. Oh, what the hell is that? Uh, Sheriff. You know, I think it's just bad manners that uh, turn a prisoner loose out here on that cold, dark night with no place to go. I wish you'd hang on to Fink until I can talk to you in the morning, huh? Yeah, and just where, where do you suppose you're going to be between now and then? I'm going to be right here trying to get some sleep. Thanks a lot, Sheriff. Nash! What the hell kind of games he playing with her in there, anyway? Did I entertain you again last night? Some? Yeah. Get some good, solid food in you today. <laughs> food? Yeah, food. It's gonna be downhill from now on. Be some tough spots. But I think you got it licked, sugar. If you want it that way. Getting up on me? <laughs> no. But I'm going to Porter City. I'll be gone for quite a while. Can I trust you to uh, behave yourself while I'm gone? Yeah. Wait. I want to talk to you. No, I mean seriously, I want to talk to you. I may never get another chance to ask you. Ask away. Why did you go through all of this for me? No, don't give me any of your fast, funny answers, because that won't help me. Why did you do it? I know that I was disgusting and revolting. Just the way I must seem to you now. Why did you do it? Please, tell me. Maybe it's something I should hear. Gabrielle, I'm uh, twice your age. I'm getting to be an old man, and I have reasons that I keep inside. Because I don't want uh, anybody to, well, so no one will uh, mistake them for anything but what they are, just feelings that I have, that I, that I want them to be. You mean? No, I, I don't, I don't mean 
anything more than I just want to say. But I want to tell you that, uh, you know, there, uh, there have been... <laughs> yeah, there have been really a lot of times that you have been revolting and disgusting. But I do it all again. And again and again. If I had the chance. Fair enough. Uh, I think you better put uh, something on you. So you don't catch uh, bronchitis or something. You know how you ex-hop heads are vulnerable to all sorts of things. See you later. At last, a non-medical friendly face in this foreign land. There's not much left of me, I'm afraid, Hamilton. Oh, God, I don't have... I'm so sorry, Owen. I'm... I can't tell you how sorry I am. Better a funeral than they say, Hamilton. I could always read your fate. Yeah, yeah, my, uh, my ugly mess. Uh, I, I don't want to tie you out on. I, uh, going over to see the sheriff, and I thought I'd stop by. He said that he talked to you and... Disturbed my beauty sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said he, you mentioned something about hearing something before the bomb went off. Always the detective. Well, you know, I'm about, about little things. What was it, uh, did you heard a, a glass or something? Yes, the window. I heard a tinkling, a clinkling of broken glass. Then I heard something hit the floor, a small thud. Oh, well. No more hotel rooms for me, eh, Hamilton? No more hotel rooms for you, Owen. You didn't hear any tinkling of broken glass. No broken window. The screen to my hotel room was blown off intact, no holes in it. There was nothing thrown in the window. Oh, you've made it tough. I'll give you that. Bink made the bar. 
handed it to you when he shook your hand. You probably thought it was some message from Arunia. And when we left the room, you opened it as he wanted you to, and... <laughs> Underestimation. That was your mistake. You underestimated your friend Fink. He got scared when he heard about Eric's murder. He was afraid that you would implicate him and that whole temple gang in your crazy game up here. It took a bomb to tie you into this. It took a bomb. Jesus. Why didn't I see it? You were the one that gave Alice Liggett the suicide gun and then killed her with it on the steps, and I didn't see it. You called Daisy Cotton. And it was you that Harv Whitten was shouting double-crosser at. Oh, God, what a bloody game you've played on. What rotten misfortune. I think I could have fooled you for life by just dying. Well, not really. Although, uh, you must have a way with women. Aronia Aldorn still hasn't betrayed you. She even took a shot at me. You must have made a play for Gabrielle right under her nose. Gabrielle. Yeah, Gabrielle. Oh, see, yours is the one name that makes her shudder. She wouldn't have you. Is that what it was? Ego. It destroyed you. Don't worry about me, Hamilton. I'll beat the gallows, you'll see. There'll be no rope for my dear neck. My trial will be a splendid circus, yes. I'll wave my mangled body at them, and 12 shocked jerk-water jurors will shake their empty heads and all declare I'm insane. <laughs> makes you laugh, huh? You find humor in that. Well, don't you see? Knowing I'm sane, that'll be the fun of it, the thrill of it. Don't you see? It was late afternoon by the time I got back to the Tugger place. I felt a thousand years old. And then I wanted to die. I saw Gabrielle out front with Mickey and Foley. She looked high in spirits, and I was guessing on morphine. Maria Grasso and my partners must have finally given in to her. Ham, your little baby has something to tell you. Better tell him, kid, before he busts a blood vessel. There. You won. But you cheated, you know. You are a devil. Truly. Truly a devil. Trying to make me believe that you love me. Just to get me through it.
For two seconds, I felt alive again. I grabbed her and hung on. I can't explain what I felt. I only knew that it was something I'd never feel again once I let go. Five months later, Owen Fitzstephan had recovered enough to stand trial. The trial turned out to be the splendid circus Owen had hoped for. Small wonder he was being tried for hiring a worthless drunk to murder a handsome son of a millionaire just to get his hands on the virgin bride. Newspapers have a picnic with things like that. I was being called as a witness for the prosecution. I didn't feel too good about that. Gabrielle, God bless her, looked fresh and healthy after five months rest at the Collinson Mountain Lodge. She appeared to be happy, a comfortable member of the Collinson household now. I should have felt good about that, but... Oh, well. The DA, Tom Vernon, saw the trial as a springboard from a small town to the big time. He was dead set on sending Owen to the gallows. So far, he'd been doing a good job of tying Owen directly to the murder of Harry Collinson. And the defense attorney was trying to convince the jury that only a crazy man would do such a thing. The jury was the hick town assembly that Stefan had expected and Vernon wanted. And crafty Jason McNally was playing them like a stringed instrument right now to judge Cochran's slight displeasure. But only in truth that he was not responsible for them. Now, Mrs. Cotton. You told Mr. Vernon here that Harvey Whitten was offered $1,000 to do away with Mrs. Collinson's new husband. Yes. Now, Harvey Whitten didn't actually tell you Mr. Owen Fitzstephan paid me $1,000 to murder Eric Collinson, now, did he? Well, no, sir. He, he said, uh, you know, fancy pants and the big car, honeymooning with the little girl. Well, that crazy writer fellow in the city offered me a thousand bucks to kill him. That crazy writer fellow in the city, but you didn't know he was referring to Mr. Fitzstephan here, did you? Oh, yes, sir. I did then. He wrote the ransom note to Mr. Fitzstephan that very night. Right in my house. The Temple of the Holy Grail. Mr. Fitzstephan was a member there? You know better than that. We both know better than that, Mr. Fink. I'm just trying to bring this out in an orderly fashion for the jury. Fitzstephan there owned the Temple of Holy Grail. He started it. The whole thing was his idea. Exactly what was the whole idea of the Temple, Mr. Fink? Well, started out, it was just a nice, clean racket, you know? I mean milk money out of religious fanatics. Some kind of game with Fitzstephan, I guess. <laughs> he uh, hired Aroni and Joseph Halder and to act like they was the big religious mucky mucks. <laughs> they was actors. I, I just worked there, though. Um, magic tricks. That, that's my business. But, uh... Got weird, I tell you. Do tell me, Mr. Fink. What do you mean by weird? Well, I mean, first he arranges to have Dr. Reese killed. And then he uh, hires the girl's husband killed. And he runs up here to have my stepbrother bumped off, keep him from talking. <laughs> I mean, he's crazy. Objection, I object, Your Honor. Move to strike. Mrs. Haldorn. You told the district attorney, Vernon, that you didn't care about Mr. Fitzstephan's attentions to the girl. Now, that's not quite true, is it? I felt it was an infatuation he would get over. You hoped he'd get over. Because Owen Fitzstephan here was your lover too, wasn't he? Our relationship transcended the mere physical. It also escaped the attention of your husband, didn't it? Was that because your husband, Joseph, was also infatuated with Gabrielle Leggett? At the end, I suspected that, yes. In fact, Gabrielle Leggett, now Gabrielle Collinson, became somewhat of a nuisance, didn't she? I don't know what you mean. I mean that at one point you endeavored to make her believe that she herself had murdered her own doctor. 
in the hope that she might be put away. I assume no responsibilities for the hallucination of a drug addict. Well, it would have suited your purpose, wouldn't it? Coincidentally, perhaps. Your husband didn't think it was any coincidence. He was so enraged by your scheme to frame Miss Leggett, he tried to kill you, didn't he? I no longer knew what went on in Joseph's mind. He'd hypnotized himself to think he was God. But Owen Fitzstephen's infatuation with the girl led to one murder. And a chain of events then led almost to your own death. I'm not really certain about any of that. Oh, come now, Mrs. Haldorn. The whole scheme of the temple to manipulate people's minds. The fiendish use of suggestion to turn obedient Minnie Hershey into a tool for murder. It was the work of a madman, wasn't it? Did Harv Whidden say anything? Now, please, think back. Did he say anything that would make you think that your husband's murder and your kidnapping were somehow connected? Once. He thought that I was dying. He shook me hard. He was mad. He kept saying something like, you've got to stay alive. That maniac isn't going to pay 10000 and unless I deliver you alive. Meaning? That he murdered your husband, kidnapped you, to obtain money from this man, Owen Fitzstephen. Mrs. Collinson, you're a grown woman. I assume we can talk frankly about a few matters. Yes. Good. Mrs. Collinson, Mr. Fitzstephen tried to make love to you on occasion, didn't he? Yes. In your own home, uh, your parents' home? Yes. What did your late father think of this? My father wasn't there at the time. My father and I, we never talked very much. What did your stepmother say about Mr. Fitzstephen trying to make love to you? She encouraged it. Did you encourage it? No. It disgusted me. I see. Was it that your stepmother saw Mr. Fitzstephen here as a desirable? Son-in-law? No. Mr. Fitzstephen was her lover. I mean, they had been that since I was a little girl. But then years later, when he moved to be near your stepmother, he switched his affections to you? No. They were still... Well, she used me to keep him around, I think. Mr. Fitzstephen was so mad for you? He tried to seduce you right in the presence of the woman who was also his lover? That's insane, isn't it? Objection. Sustained. Very well. Mrs. Collinson, are you aware of the fact that Mr. Fitzstephen is an author? Yes. Are you aware of the nature of the material? Yes. Its obsession with the bizarre, the mysterious, the superstitious. Its fascination with the mystically erotic. Certainly not the work of a sane man, would you say? Objection. Sustained. All right, all right. Mrs. Collinson, your family name was Dane, am I correct? My mother was a Dane, yes, Lily Dane. Now, there's been a lot of purple prose written in the newspapers the last several months about some so-called Dane curse. Now, you don't really believe that you're a cursed girl, leading people to perform criminal acts, all sorts of murder and mayhem, do you? No, sir. I did once. I hid from the thought for a long, long time through drugs. But that was my curse. It's over now. Thank God. What if I told you, Mrs. Collinson, that the Dane curse is not dead? What if I told you, Mrs. Collinson, that the Dane curse still lives in the man you see before you, Owen Fitzstephen, oh. the madness that surrounded you, suffocated you, wasn't your madness, but his, Owen Fitzstephen. His mother, your maternal grandfather, were brother and sister, Danes. You're right, Mrs. Collinson, the strength of your father's blood left you immune, but the cursed Dane blood still flows in the veins of Owen Fitzstephen. Now you can forgive, at least understand, 
the madness of this man who so insanely pursued you. <laughs> Curses. Your Honor, I suggest that it is time that this court took an honest, true, objective look at this case. The state calls Mr. Hamilton Nash. The news that Owen was a Dane seemed to shake the jury, just like it startled me a little. And Vernon wanted to shake them back to their senses. He was determined to get a hanging verdict, and I was waiting for him to call me to the stand to tell the jury that Owen was as sane as anyone in the room. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and the matter before this court's healthy God. I do. Be seated, please. State your name. Hamilton Nash. Mr. Nash, what is your occupation? I'm a private investigator. I work for the uh, Dickerson National Detective Agency. For how long, Mr. Nash, have you been a professional private investigator? Uh, 17 years. 17 years, a professional private investigator. For several of those years, you've been acquainted and involved in one way or another with the defendant, Mr. Owen Fitzstephan. Is that correct? Yes, yes. In view of the logic and brilliance with which these crimes have been perpetrated, could you tell this court, in your opinion, whether you consider Owen Fitzstephan to be a sane man? I object, Your Honor. Mr. Nash is not a doctor, not a psychiatrist. Mr. Nash has dealt with criminals of all types for many years. I am simply asking his professional opinion as a criminal investigator. Mr. McNally, you uh, keep opening this door. You must expect the district attorney to walk through it once in a while. I'll permit the question only in the light of the witness's capacity as an experienced detective. I repeat the question. Do you think Owen Fitzstephan is sane? Well, I've known Owen a long time. A very long time. Now, he wants you all to believe that he's insane. All of those books that his lawyer mentioned, those weird books that Owen has written. He wants you to think that he's finally fallen victim to all of his obsessions with the mysteries, the curses, the occult uh, diabolical schemes. He wants you to feel that he's finally lost touch with God and man through some sort of blood thing, the Dane curse or something. I don't know about that. I really don't. But even though he wants you to believe him insane, he wants me to see through him. He wants me to see him as a devilishly clever, positively sane man who's playing some monstrous joke on the world, some trick. But it's not a trick. It's not illusion. It's, uh... Oh, well, for the record, and, uh, I guess in the interest of justice, whatever that is, I have to say uh, that there's no doubt about it in my mind. Uh, Owen is mad as a hatter. <laughs> I have no further questions, Your Honor. I have no further questions either, Your Honor. May step down, Mr. I never saw Owen after that day. The jury took pity on him and sent him to the insane asylum. Aronia Haldorn, sweet Aronia, swore to mother and care for Owen Fitzstephan the rest of his days. So maybe the Dane curse is still alive, somewhere. Tom Fink got a quick five to ten year sentence for attempted murder of Owen with that bomb. Minnie Hershey got three years probation for involuntary manslaughter for killing Dr. Reese. And as a token of their appreciation, old Hubert Collinson invited me to the Collinson shanty. 
As a token of my stupidity, I went and was trying to leave as fast as I could. Well, didn't you join us in the library for a cigar and a brandy? Ah, uh, no, no, I can't. I'm sorry. I have a lead on this guy who's bail jumper. He's posing as a madam down in Chinatown. <laughs> well, then I'll just say good night. Mr. Nash, you are unique. I don't know that I always quite agree with your methods, but by God, your results are astonishing. Well, you're a man of your word. That's a little unique in this day and age in itself. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. I'll see you out. Gabrielle was in a different world now. She wasn't in the Tooker place. She didn't need me anymore. Sometimes things hurt when they're the way they should be. Will we see you again? Not if you behave yourself. I was telling Lawrence that if he finds me uncouth at times, he's to blame you. Really? Mm-hmm. You cursed me, ridiculed me, and uh, even professed to love me. To cure me. I couldn't go through that again. still hear her voice, kind of fresh and young and lovely. Not for me, of course, but hell, a man's entitled to keep a few warm thoughts on a cold night. I was long overdue in the world where I fit. Rum runners, thieves, ladies of the night with pistols in their garters, real people who keep guys like me busy. The Dane curse was over. I did my job. I'm just a detective, fair enough. <laughs> 